thank you all for joining us on our virtual program. Uh, I'm really excited for you all to be here. Um, but before we begin, I would like to say that this program is a step-by-step -step watercolor exercise. And what's great about this is that I will be painting live. So you will be able to see me live while I paint towards the end of the presentation. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. I really am looking forward to be working with all of you here today. I hope that you will come in with an open mind and explore the freedom of what watercolor uh, brings. So I think we're ready to begin. So um, I would like to begin with a little bit about an introduction for me. Um, so hi, my name is Jacqueline Alamantena, but you can call me Jackie, Jack, Jax, or Miss J, or <laughs> whatever you like. I can go by all of those. Um, first and foremost, I work for the Plano Public Library, and I'm a little shy, about five years. It goes really, really fast. Um, I have a lot of fun working at the library, and I really enjoy working here at the city of Plano. Um, so my history begins, I am from El Paso, Texas, which is at the very corner west Texas. Uh, and my drawing and, uh, interests have begun very, at a very, very young age. Uh, my grandparents and my mom really did instill a lot of freedom in my artistic capabilities and interests. So I actually pursued that all the way up until adulthood. I have a bachelor's in art education in C through 12. So I don't know, I just, you know, stuck with the art. And um, one thing I really, really loved and one of my favorite mediums is watercolor. And what I love about watercolor is just that it's so free, you know, um, there is no, per there's no perfection when it comes to watercolor. It goes with the flow. And um, I'm hoping that by this presentation, you all will get a chance to see that and um, hopefully be able to work with that as well. And we'll get to all work together. So that's just a little bit about me um, uh, in this picture. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, I wanted to begin with, oh, we can go to the next slide. Great. So I wanted to begin with a uh, quote it's called, uh, it's by Kendi Wiley. He says, what I love in art is that it takes known combinations and records them in a way that sheds light on something that they have never seen before and allows to consider the world in a slightly different way. So when I was, um, what I really, really liked about this quote is that you know, there's a, there's a beauty in the fact that there's fluidity. I, I, what I took in this quote is that each painting that you do when it comes to watercolor is the fact that it's gonna be completely unique. So no matter how many times you're gonna be doing a still life or no matter how many times you're gonna be painting that one flower, it's not gonna look exactly the same. And especially when it comes to watercolor because it's very fluid. So I really, I really hope that you get, um, an understanding that there is no perfection in watercolor. There is no, um, I would, I, I mean, I would have some expectation of what colors that you want, but as far as the application goes, sometimes it's not gonna go the way we like, but I think, I think that's what makes watercolor a really beautiful medium. So uh, yeah, um, that quote is what I thought would be really nice to begin with. So we can go to the next present PowerPoint. All right, so what you will learn today, um, you will learn um, basics on watercolor materials. Um, this is a five-step course to painting watercolor floral still life. So the idea behind uh, floral still lifes today is that because of our quarantine, we're all at home, um, We'll walk around, I know I do, when I, when I was um, at home, um, I would walk my dogs outside and look at the neighbor, neighborhoods and, you know, the houses down and see all their flowers and just thought, you know, it'd be really nice to do a still life with flowers. And I think that's a really calming, uh, calming thing. So I decided, you know, why not do a still life using the flowers that I have in like my backyard print them on the table, have fun with watercolors, and just 
take the stresses away. So this five-step course um, was inspired by that. Um, step one, you will be learning how to plan and sketch your still life. Um, step two, you will draw. Um, draw your um, uh, flowers and your still life. Step three is to paint your background. And the finishing touches is step five. And then um, the end, there is a reference list. So those references I use to help create this presentation. So I really hope that you get a chance to access that and um, maybe use that for your references as well. So we can go on to the next one. Great. So um, understanding watercolor and materials. First thing I think we should go over is paints. So if you um, have any awareness of watercolors, you'll know that there are two types of uh, watercolor paints. There are the pans and the tubes. And they both have strengths in their own unique ways, um, which is really great because uh, sometimes you'll feel that the tubes might help you. Sometimes you might feel that the pans are the ones that you really like the most. So let's go ahead and understand a little bit about both. Pans is a uh, trays containing several dry blocks of paint. So um, usually, uh, you know, we all began, I know when I did when I was in elementary school, we had those Crayola pans of watercolor where you had to apply water. That is what is a pan. What's really good, what's really great about those is that they are portable. Um, they usually have a little top where you can just take it once it's dry. And you can use outdoors if you feel like you wanted to paint outside. Um, the pigments are really strong. And what's nice is that they dry and once they're dry, you can still apply them again and you'll still get that same pigment. So I really, really like that. Okay, so um, for large watercolors, uh, like for example, if you're gonna use a really large 11 by 15 or maybe even larger sheets of uh, paper, you might want to use the tubes. Um, pan paints are really good for small um, illustrations um, just because there is only so much paint that you have on those pans. The tubes um, are moist paste-like paint, just like uh, acrylics in a way. They, they usually come in either a plastic tube or a metal tube. Um, you can either buy them per uh, uh, individually or in sets. These are really good for studio works um, or if you're uh, painting large, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like 11 by 15 sheets of watercolor uh, paper. Uh, these are great to get uh, more, more uh, area. So uh, these are really good for that. Um, and these are also great too if you're gonna do like a dry on dry application. Um, and you'll be hearing that more um, once I'm going to be drawing on the techniques that I'll be using today. But uh, dry on dry is a dry brush on dry paper. So you can get that really nice uh, detailing as well. So again, there is no difference in quality. They are both equally good. You can find some good, uh, I actually really like Crayola. Crayola is a, a good medium too. Um, you can spend you know, five or six dollars on a tray or if you feel like you want to explore tubes and get some better uh, quality ones that you feel, go ahead. Um, the best way I can tell you this much is to have fun and try them out. You're never, know, you're never going to know what works best for you until you try them out because everyone's going to have a difference of opinion on what uh, paints that you want to use. So that is my take on paint. So we can go to the next page. Awesome. So um, understanding watercolor materials part two. Um, I'm going to only go over three brushes, okay, um, because those are the three that I'm going to be using today. So for watercolor brushes, um, you can use a uh, sable hair or something like a, like, a, like a fur type of hair, or you can use um, synthetic brushes. So what I mean by hair is like the the, the actual brush itself, okay? Um, what I really like about synthetic brushes is that they are inexpensive. You can buy synthetic brushes for like a set for like five or six dollars at a craft store, um, or you can buy them individually. Uh, usually you'll find those with like the 
um, animal hair kind. Those are really nice too. Um, I personally like the synthetic ones just because um, you can use them and use them and use them and once you're done, you can just buy another set and it's not much out of your pocket. It's like about $5 per set. Um, and sometimes I will have that for a long time, depending on how you take care of your uh, brushes. Um, there are three I'm going to be using today. It is the Filburn brush, the flat brush, and the round brush. So the Filburn brush is thick, flat, and flat. It has like that round curve. The Filburn brush, uh, the reason why I'm using that one today is because it's going to give a really nice detail on leaves. Okay. So for leaves or for petals, this is a great brush to use. Um, the flat brush is great for backgrounds because it's going to give a flat background base. It's going to look um, even throughout the back, background of your illustration or your painting. And if you want to paint the background, again, um, in this presentation, I'm going to be doing that. But again, you don't have to do that. It's totally up to you. This is a fun program, so this is completely however you want to take it. The last one is a round. I really love a round brush. Um, I'm going to be using that one most often. You can get lots of detailing, um, branches, details on, um, on uh, the petals as well as the flowers. Um, but again, brushes come in a variety of shapes. Um, the best one is natural hair and synthetic one. So those are the two that you will mostly use for watercolor. So that is my take on shiz. And Jackie, we have a question about um, yeah. a alternative to flat brushes. Uh, Pam asked, she said she couldn't find a good flat brush and she got a aquarelle brush and asked if that was close to the same. Go ahead and Okay, so uh, what was it called? Aqua Rel? Yes, uh, Aqua like the color and then R E L L E. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Go ahead and see. Um, oh, yeah, that one will be really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's, that one's pretty good too. Um, let's go ahead and see the images here. No, these that will work just fine. Um, I think also too when it comes to the brushes is that you will see that there are really really thin ones and really really thick brushes. The thicker brushes, um, even though they're shorter, um, basically absorbs a lot more water. So you can use that uh, to to get those backgrounds. That's the entire purpose of the, the, the flat. But if you have that other brush, that aqua rail, that one should be fine too. So no, these are great. These are great questions. Please feel free to ask any questions along the way. Um, yeah, just this is this is it. Okay, so I think we're ready for the uh, what you will need for this program, right? Okay, yeah, we're there. Um, so what you will need for this program is watercolor paper. Um, the one that I will be using today is a Kansen watercolor paper. It is a cold press. Um, you can use hot press or cold press, but today I'm going to be using that. Both are durable surfaces and that are used for watercolor. Um, I'm only doing the cold press because I want a flatter surface. Um, but for really nice textured ones, you might want a, a hot press. Um, for um, watercolor today, uh, I'm using a 140 pound watercolor paper. Uh, just uh, to answer, I'm, my assumption would be we'll, we'll probably have some questions concerning the weight of paper. That is also another thing that you might want to take note of when it comes to watercolor. The heavier the weight, the more water it, it can absorb. So if you're going to be using, uh, I do not recommend using a uh, printing paper or like paper from a notebook. Um, when it comes to watercolor and paper, quality does actually matter because you're going to be disappointed when you're painting on a computer sheet of paper and the paper is going to tear apart. So that is something I wanted to mention ahead of time. Um, 
with the cans and paper. There are lots of brands too. Um, again, talking about with paints, it depends on what you like. Um, I'm using Kansan just because it's a bit more on the affordable side and um, I, I have this set already with me. So that is the watercolor paper that you will need. Watercolor brushes, including a flat filbert and round. That is what I'm going to be using today. But um, if you have any other brushes, please feel free. What's great about watercolor is that you're going to realize how much your the brush is going to take water from and paint. But um, you're going to be seeing that I'm going to be using the flat filbert and round brush. Um, watercolors, um, go ahead and use, get some watercolors. Um, today I'm going to be using um, pans, just because I'm going to be drying on a smaller surface. Um, you might, you will need a cup or jar of clean water. Clean water is important because if you have a cup of water that has, a, you know, a lot of paint, and you want to clean your brush and you apply, you know, let's just say you clean, you were using a black paint and you clean your brush with that cup of water and you're going to use a, you know, a really light green. Once you get that water in, you're going to notice that that really light green is going to turn a dark green. So you want to make sure that you change your water. Once you start noticing that that water is starting to change color, that's when you want to go ahead and change your water again. Um, paper towels or a cloth rag. Um, that is going to be using to dry your brushes um, and masking tape. Masking tape is good on a flat surface because you're going to notice that if you don't use masking, I'm going to use a uh, painter's tape um, because it's uh, not as hard on whenever I'm done painting. You can pull it off the paper and it's not going to damage it or also the table. Um, painter's tape is preferred, um, but you're going to want to mask the tape um, to the paper so when you paint on it, it's going to keep that surface flat. So once it's dry, the paper is going to dry flat. If you don't tape it, it's going to be pretty wrinkly. So that is that. So we're, I think we're going to begin with our steps. So I'm going to quickly go over the steps that we're going to be doing today. Okay, we're going to go through five steps. And then from there, we're gonna go live and we're gonna go ahead and uh, you're gonna see my little setup here. You're gonna see my paper and my illustrations and uh, we will go from there. So step one is planning and sketching. So first thing you wanna do is plan your scene. So have a table, um, consider the arrangement, the location and lighting. Um, when I began this program idea, um, my uh, desk, my little desk that I set up was um, in the dining area and there is a lot of natural light. So I went ahead and put my table towards the window and I placed a jar and like the flowers that I gathered and I wanted to use that natural light. Do you need natural light? Not necessarily. You can use the right, um, any other light that you have at home as well. What's nice about the natural light is you'll get a lot of really nice shading. So if you really want to go into detail with your painting, you can definitely get those. My only warning with natural light, though, is the fact that it's not going to stay like that forever. So if you have a camera, if there is an angle set that you want, my suggestion is to take a photograph and make sure that picture captures what you want. So once, let's just say you begin painting at, you know, 10 in the morning and then <laughs> you're drawing and you're setting up and you're trying to get those shades, it's going to change by 2 or 3 p.m. So um, that, that's the only downfall to natural lighting, uh, but you can use your lighting in an aunt and any, like a, you know, your room or anything like that, wherever you have access to. The next thing you want to do is tape your paper to a flat surface. Um, once you paint, once you uh, tape your paper, that is the, the angle of what you're going to be drawing and where you're going to be looking at your your pick at your still life. Okay. When I refer to still life or flowers, um, that's what I mean because that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be doing a still life and also a floral watercolor, um, and that's that. So go ahead and mark your pa paper using light marking. So basically a quick sketch of like how the layout is going to be. Okay. 
So that is step one of planning and sketching. Let's go ahead in the second one. Okay, all right. So step two is drawing and creating your scene. So first and foremost, I'm just going to be using a standard number two pencil. Um, you can also use, uh, and I have one of these, it's called a, a call erase. These are, um, I, I guess you could say kind of a, a, an illustration pencil that animators use. I really like those because it's a really light, light, light blue. They come in uh, blue or red. Um, you can find those at um, a Michaels or a, um, any store where it sells like pencils and things like that, you can find those there. Um, you can use those too. Um, my suggestion is to not use a like a charcoal type of pencil or anything like that because that can be mixed in with the watercolor. A number two pencil should be fine as long as you don't press too hard on the drawing. So the watercolor will cover most of your illustration. Again, um, I'm going to keep on reminding y'all it's not perfect if once you paint it and you still see some of that pencils, that's totally fine. In fact, I, I rather like that. I think that shows the fact that, you know, I actually drew it. Um, so drawing, uh, first you want to do is select reference points. So what I mean by that is um, just look at your reference point. For me, and, and you're going to see this, uh, my reference point is the cup. So I'm trying to make the cup center of the uh, drawing. And then from there, that's where I'm going to see where all the flowers are located, where the branches are placed and the leaves, how they're falling from my vision. Um, so once um, you don't need to capture every single detail, okay? What you want to do is gather the shapes. So like as you see in this picture here, you see that there is uh, you know, they captured the flowers and some of the leaves, but they didn't go into detail as far as like, let's just say if those flowers had a pattern, right? You're going to use that with the watercolor itself, okay? What's, um, what's great about watercolor is the fact that it's a very patient medium. You need to be patient with watercolor. If you want to get into those details, you're going to have to wait until your, pa your paper dries so that way you can go ahead and apply those details once it's done. So again, yes, yes, yes. Um, we have a question about uh, what pencils will work. Um, Kay asked if a 4B pencil would work. Yes, any of the Bs, uh, well, 4B might be a bit heavy. Um, maybe Hs would probably be best just because they're a little bit lighter. Um, today, I'm just going to be using a standard two pencil just because I feel like that's something that, you know, most people will have. Um, if you're going to be using any type of B and if that's all you have, that's fine. But just make sure that whenever you illustrate or when you're drawn to the surface to do a very light application. You don't want to press too hard on the paper because then once you paint, you're going to still see that heavy mark. Um, so, and, and, and sometimes you're going to see that that water, that water is going to spread that um, graphite onto the paper. So, uh, so yeah, just again, just be careful in the application of how you press your pencil onto the paper. You're going to see whenever I'm drawing right now that I'm not pressing too hard on the drawing. Um, yeah, just be very light with it. Just be very light with it. Is there any other questions or are we good? Are we good? Yeah, okay. Um, I think we're ready for step three. Perfect. All right, so step three is paint the background. So then you can go ahead and set up your jar and your paper towels and rags from cleaning brushes. Make sure you have your setup ready to clean your brushes there. Um, Go ahead and select one or two colors. Um, you can choose more. I just choose, I put two just because it's, um, you know, my assumption is that we're all beginners here. So I think two simple backgrounds is fine. This, um, this uh, example here is done by like a professional illustrator. Um, but today what I'm gonna be doing, I'm gonna do a little bit on the lighter end. Um, 
So I'm just going to be using a really light gray, almost you can still see the color of the paper. Um, I'm going to be using a flat brush to get those flat surfaces. So um, background, you can paint the background. So when you paint over whenever you do the flowers on top, you're going to see that it's going to paint on top of the background. This example here is a bit on the darker end, um, but again, it's totally up to you. If you want to go ahead and do that, by all means, if you want to go ahead and use a different color, go ahead by all means. What's great about watercolor is that it's unique to you, right? It's unique on how you apply the paint on the brush. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and begin light, just because I feel that um, if I want to go back and work on it again, I could. So go ahead and paint the background. Um, that will be our step three. And I think we're ready for our step four. Great. So step four is <clears throat> painting the flowers. So one thing I love about painting watercolors uh, and florals is the fact that um, it looks more natural, I feel, if you just allow the brush and the paint to kind of do its own thing. And you'll see it as, as I paint, um, kind of move your hand the way the, the petals work. I guess it's kind of weird for me to explain it, but whenever you see me do it, I hope that you'll understand what I mean. So painting flowers is going to be uh, uh, just, you know, work on the flowers each one at a time. Um, you can also at the same time work on the background correction. So if you have that gray, for example, that, I, that you know, I'm going to be using for my still life, um, I can apply a little bit more in the crevices between the green leaves or the pink flowers that I have set up. Um, this is again a very patient uh, procedure. Um, my recommendation is whenever after this presentation you go home and want to do another one, have your headphones on, play some music, and just you know have fun noticing each petal, each color. Um, a helpful tip is to have pre uh, paints already set up. What I mean by that is like have like have a little tray where you're going to mix your watercolors. If you see that your flowers have like, if you have like lavender or if you have like, you know, peach uh, roses or um, if you have sage, um, have that little tray set up already and then have those watercolors kind of mix on top of those trays. So you can go back to it to save you some time. Or if you feel like you want to add a little bit more, you can and you can use that again. So that's just another tip that you can use. So we're going to be uh, painting flowers. So that one, I believe that one's going to be the one that I will be spending most of my time doing. Okay, so I think we're ready for step five. All right, so step five is the finishing touches, okay? So between step four and step five is really universal to you. So for finishing touches, let's just say you're at step four, you're still painting your flowers and you feel like you're done. Step away for like maybe two hours, an hour, maybe even the next day. And if you're looking at your flowers again, Look and see if there's any details that you want to touch up. This is a great opportunity for applying the techniques of uh, dry on dry, so you can have your dry paper. And if let's just say you wanted to get um, some specific details and very, very dry detail, then you can get onto that part as well. So the finishing touches is really just, the, again, the finishing touches, anything that you feel like you've missed or wanted to add a little bit more, you can definitely do that. And this uh, finishing touches also includes whenever you're done to go ahead and sign the name. And of course, you want to make sure that your painting is completely done before you remove the tape. But that also is included in step five. And um, please be careful whenever you remove your tape because it is also wet on the tape and it has dried together. So just pull gently. Again, watercolor is a very patient medium, you know, uh, by every sense of the word. So that is that. Is there any questions before we begin? 
Is everyone ready? Does, does everyone have their uh, materials ready? Because at this point, we're ready to go ahead and start with the sharing process. Um, any questions so far? Okay, I think I have a raised hand. Do you want, um, you want to go uh, yeah, ahead? We've, we've, we've addressed it, um, so I think you're good to go. So go ahead and oh, switch over to your, your camera. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share it. You're gonna see me toggle back and forth um, really, really quick. I'm gonna go ahead and share content right now. Assuming the camera behaves. It says this <laughs> other screen sharing, do you want to continue? Um, say yes, you want to get the key. Or I can try stopping it, let's see. Yeah, there it goes, it's working. Okay, so you're gonna see uh, the tablet that I'm gonna be using, yay. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so here is the setup. Is everyone good? Can everyone see so far? Raise your hand if you can't see and we'll address it. Okay. Okay, I think we're good to go. We're good to go. Okay, mm -hmm. so right here, um, if, I'm gonna go ahead and move the camera a bit, a little bit and zoom out. So right here is my little setup, okay? I pulled these flowers out this morning. Um, outside the library. So we're very lucky to have such beautiful flowers here at Davis. Um, the set I'm going to be using today, um, I don't know if you all are really uh, Instagram people, but I am always on my Instagram and Instagram did it again and did a <laughs> an ad on watercolors. And what I thought was great was that these watercolors, they pan out. It was about $30. So these are the watercolors I'm gonna be using today. What I really like about these watercolors is that not only does it come in a really cute little case, but um, it also came with a watercolor brush as well. And uh, I will be using this. You'll see some of these too. Um, I'll use it if I feel like I want to, but um, it came with that. It came with the drying pad, and uh, these are the colors that I'll be using today. Um, I also have these two. Um, this is a uh, Yasumoto uh, K or paints. These are pearlescent, so these have like really nice metallic finishes. Okay. Um, these are the ones I'm going to be using today. If you have tubes, that is definitely okay, as long as you have your basic colors, um, um, like yellow, uh, green, blue, uh, black, orange, um, indigo, anything like that. I'm going to be also using this as a way to kind of mix my colors. Here is a color that I used already for the background. It's obviously a condensed version of it but I'm gonna be using that for my background. Here are the brushes I'm gonna be using today. Oops, excuse me. So this is the flat brush I will be using today. And if you notice that the brush itself is a bit thick, this is great because it's able to get a lot of water. Okay, so if any of you have any questions when it comes to brushes and thicknesses and, and, and the like, the reason why we're um, you going to be using different types of flats, filberts, and rounds is because it's going to apply the paint. This one's going to have a lot more than, for example, this one. Okay, these are both flat brushes. This one's a size eight, and this one is a size one. Okay, um, I got these at Michaels. Okay, and they came as a set, and these are the synthetic brush. So this is what the synthetic brush looks like. Um, and then this is also another uh, synthetic one too. Okay. And uh, filberts. So here's a filbert brush. This is a size four. It's a bit on the thicker end too. And so this one's going to get some really nice leaves and a lot more uh, area. 
Um, this is also another filbert. This one's a bit on the thicker end. It's also a size eight, similar to this. These are both the same size, different brush, okay. And for detailing, I love to use me a round. Um, so these rounds are gonna, you're gonna see me use rounds most often. I feel like those are the brushes that I tend to gravitate towards. What I like about the round, at least this one, you're going to see that you can press here and you can get that nice detail at the tip. So you're gonna see the application being pressed and then you're gonna get that nice tip. So you can get some thickness onto the application and then some quite some small details as well. So those are gonna be the brushes I'm going to be using today. This is going to be the uh, watercolors I'm gonna be using today. This is my paper and this is where I'm gonna dry. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you the paper I'm gonna be using today. It is the Canson Cold Press, okay? You can find this at uh, um, Michael's. Um, this is an 11 by 17, but I actually quartered it to make it small. Um, the reason why I'm going a little bit small today is um, you can use these for cards, um, motifs, I hope that you can get inspired by making some gifts as well, perhaps. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and begin. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with step one. Are we all ready to go? Does anyone have any questions before I begin? No? Okay, so um, we're gonna go ahead and go on step one. So the first thing what I'm gonna do on step one is I'm gonna go ahead and tape it. So I'm just going to be using a painter's tape and I'm going to go ahead and move my hand a little bit here and then I'm just going to use my painter's tape and apply it like so. Okay so I'm getting about a little less than half an inch on each edge. Um, it's really up to you. It's a preference. It's not necessarily there is a purpose as to why I'm doing it. I'm just doing it that way. If you want to go ahead and do a whole inch, you can. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and tape it first. Taping it is going to keep the paper in place throughout the entire painting process. So that's part of step one. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and begin with my still life. Now I want it to be in a room where I have a uh, light throughout. So I'm in this room here um, and I'm going to use this glass here as my reference point. I'm going to go ahead and use my pencil here. I'm just going to use a standard um, pencil and I'm just going to go ahead and you put on a line in the center. Again, I'm going really, really light. The line here, I'm going to use that so that's going to help me keep things centered. If you want to go ahead and if you want to, you can also go ahead and draw on the edge if you want to, uh, you know, not make your illust or your painting centered. But for me, I would like to make it centered. Um, I'm gonna be using this drawing to send to my mom, um, just because I miss her very much and she's in El Paso. So I'm gonna be drawing here. So right here, I'm gonna be drawing the glass. So I'm using this center line to allow me to go ahead and draw the glass. Now, this is obviously not as even here. And that's the lovely thing about watercolor is that's okay. You have to be patient with yourself. You have to be patient with how you draw things. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I really love watercolor so much is that it's just such a very patient medium. So 
Um, there are lots of YouTube videos too on how to do uh, watercolor florals. There are people that can just want to paint on their own and that's totally fine. The only reason why I am beginning with the illustration process is just because um, for me, I feel like I need more of a reference point. Um, but there are some people that want to go ahead and do it a little bit more organically, just allowing the brush to do its job and the paint as well, have them just look and see if they want to. That's totally fine. But I just, I'm thinking about myself as like, what if I was a beginner? What if I'm, you know, starting off for the first time? I, I can't do that on my own. So I think just kind of drawing it out is a great way just to kind of see where your focal points are at. Hey, Jackie, would it be possible to zoom in a little more so that uh, they could see the details? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And please feel free again if you feel like you want me to zoom out or if you have any questions. There is, this is all live, so I'm here like waiting for uh, any ideas or anything like that. Um, uh, feel free. So right now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm looking at the flowers where they are located against the glass. So I'm just kind of drawing this out here. And I'm going to be doing that. So that's basically step one. I'm going to be drawing things out in reference to each other. So if I see that there is like some flowers here, I see that my glass also has a little line. So I'm referencing this in comparison to this. I'm using this little stick that I have that's sticking out here. It's this away from this leaf that's located right here. So that is step one. And you're gonna see like, oh, why are you removing this? It's because I've done some already. So, Here we go, you can see that paper there, that's kind of where I have things centered. This is step one and step two. Okay, so I already had drawn my illustration. I compared everything here against the glass. I compared the flowers against the stick. So that is the still life aspect of this presentation is comparing you know, the size of the flowers, the size of the leaves in comparison to the stick, in comparison to the glass. There are also a lot of other techniques. If you have your glass a bit further away or your flowers a bit further away, um, you can use your pencil as a reference point. You can look away and use the pencil as the angle of where the flowers or the leaves are located that. And you get that angle and you mimic it and you place it immediately onto the paper. And usually I'll put like my, uh, my, uh, pa my, my finger there and that's where I can start to draw. Um, so you can use your pencil as a reference point. Um, for me, I just, because watercolors is such a fluid uh, medium, um, having things not perfect is totally fine. In fact, I would like to remind y'all that watercolor is, is, the imperfections is what makes it beautiful. So, I think we're ready for step three. Um, so step three is to paint your background. And so this is step three. This is where I kind of already painted the background and you're gonna see me go ahead and work with this. So I'm gonna just go ahead and spread it apart. Okay, and use these colors. If you have a new palette and you don't know if you wanna see how the application goes, my recommendation is to create a little, like a, like go ahead and get some paper, get a paper and just apply it onto the, to the paper and see like how the pigments are looked at. Okay, so I'm gonna begin with this, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> flat brush. I'm gonna be using the, the uh, size eight um, flat. I'm just gonna dip it in some water here. And um, I'm gonna get here, it's already pre-done, it's gray. I used um, a bit of blue and a bit of black. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna get that edge. 
So you see this, how, how much it absorbed? Now I can just go back with the paper, I mean with the water, and then just plan what I do with steam. So what's nice about the flat is that um, it's kind of hard to, to draw this way, but it gets a really nice even stroke, which is great for backgrounds. Now, when you have those leaves coming in, that's when you can use um, your round brush to get those details. But I'm not there quite yet. So I'm gonna get a little bit here, a little bit here. Those are really strong pigment, but that's okay because then we can go back with the water and go like so. So this illustration has already been uh, drawn. The paper has been applied with water already. And at this point, we're working with the background. Okay, so that is step three. Um, the example in the PowerPoint, you saw that there is a lot more pigmentation. I really like this re really light gray, this kind of, it has like a, a blue to it, blue tint. So I'm just going to stick with that, just because that's the background and color that I want. Um, if you want to use a different uh, color background that you, you want to make up, feel free. Again, watercolor is completely however you want to do it. The next thing I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be painting flowers. So we're at step four. So first thing I'm going to do, um, I'm going to zoom a little bit out or here. You're going to see that there are pink flowers. So I'm going to get some water and I'm going to go ahead and create that pink. So I have this really nice color here. And you see how much pigment that is right there? Good. I'm gonna get this tray and get this red. And then I'm gonna, it has a bit of purple, so I'm gonna get some purple hues. Um, another really good example or good thing to note is that um, you can also save these see how much pigment that is. So um, if you let it dry on here, it'll still save that color. It has a bit more purple. And I think maybe I can get a little orange in there, see what goes, oh no. <laughs> We're gonna go back to that purple. Some of this blue. It's like a fuchsia, isn't it? Let's try that. So I'm going to go ahead and follow those details of the line work with the flowers. So what I'm going to do is, because there's this, like lightness in this here, I'm just going to go ahead and go really lightly on the brush. Right now, the technique I'm going to be doing is called a dry on, or a, a wet on dry, which means that this paper here is dry, but my application is wet. If I wanted to do things a bit different, I can put water here. And as you see how that paint just kind of spread apart right there. You can also do that too. Now it doesn't quite match the vibrant purple that I have. But that or that fuchsia color, that's okay because I can always go back and work on it again. 
you can add layers to paint. And what's great about watercolor is that you can add layers to it as well. Right here, I directly applied the paint that I have, um, the tree. onto the paper. So you have those really strong pigmentations. So I'm just gonna go ahead and leave that alone and I'm gonna go jump on towards a leaf, okay? So I'm gonna be working on a leaf. Um, I'm gonna be getting, um, let's see, I'm gonna be getting a little bit of this green and I'm gonna put it here. Is there any questions so far today? We did have a question about drawing vines, but um, I'm not sure if we have enough time to squeeze that in today. Drawing vines? Yes, how to draw like vines uh, that, you know, plants that have vines. Yeah, so um, I have a twig right here that I can draw. So what I'm gonna be, I can um, definitely do that. So the, depending on what kind of uh, vine or like ivy or whatever you're drawing, you want to pay attention first to the branch. So with this plant, I'm going to be using, um, I'm going to zoom a little bit further out. I'm going to be painting this, this one right here. Okay, so as you can see, it's kind of a lighter green and the leaves are very strong. So what I'm going to be doing is um, I'm going to get that light green. It actually kind of matches the one I was already using. So I'm just going to clean my brush again. And as you can see, I'm, I always have this piece of paper just to dry out my brush. I'm going to go with this green again. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to add a little bit, just a little bit of yellow. Another technique, my recommendation is that if your colors tend to be a bit on the very vibrant side, which mine is not, but if you do have um, a palette that has very strong and vibrant colors, and if you want to mute them a little, go ahead and add a light brown. Browning uh, the paper tends, or the, the paint tends to make it a bit on the muted side, um, if you want to have that as well. But I mean, again, it's totally up to you. So with the line, you can just go ahead and press and go in. Um, if I wanted to go ahead and add some of that brown. I feel like there's like a tinge, a little bit more brown. I need that detail. And that's like the great thing about like the round is that you can, you can press, but you can also go really light. So um, I haven't used the filter yet and I've been using the round quite often. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab my Tilbert brush and I'm gonna go ahead and work on another leaf. So I have a really large green leaf. You saw those really vibrant green leaves. Um, and I'm gonna be using this really pretty vibrant green. I'm gonna mix a little bit of this green too with it. Add some more. Let's just see a little bit of brown too, because I, I don't want it to be too, too Crayola bright. And also, again, layering. Once your paint or your paper is lightly dry, you can always add again. The filbert brush is great for getting those really thick and thin. See how I pressed? It's grabbing all of that water, but it's releasing. And if I can go light again, you can do that. Filberts are great for, for leaves. They are great for flowers and for petals. See the layering that would happen. This paper, because I didn't add too much water, 
big dragon had like almost like a shade. And again, remind you guys that watercolor is a very patient medium. And although this is not the green that I want, it has the underlying colors like that. So I can apply some more paint on top of it and get that really nice texture that I'm looking for. Now I'm getting this here, this uh, edge, and you can see some of the paint on the end. See what that looks like. Isn't that pretty? So for step five is when you have completed everything and then you're going to add that additional layering and wait. Step five tends to be the longer step because you're adding more paint then you're waiting for it to dry. And if you feel like you're done, it's like the, the, the phase of like, should it be done or not? I don't know. But one thing I've learned is that some, I know for a fact whenever I draw or whenever I paint, I feel like, you know what? I feel like it's done. It's done. I think it's pretty much done. And then I go back and I look at it and I'm like, no, I don't think it's done. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the step five. It's just, you know, be patient and seeing what you, what you like. I'm gonna go use this really small round. This is a, a I guess like two slash zero, it's like less than a one. It's like a half round. These are, oh, excuse me, these are really great for little details. So with my little display that I have here, I like this really cute like berry uh, display. I think we're running a little bit over time. I'm just gonna keep on going. <laughs> Please tell me if I'm going over a little bit over. But um, here's a little berry that I'm gonna do. This is like vine. And I'm gonna get, I'm gonna use that same color and maybe add a little bit of green. Oh, that's really pretty. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and use that green. And if I wanted to go back and use a dry brush, I can add a little bit of dry. Now what you're looking at um, right before we finish is that it's not a completed piece. Again, this is a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to be able to do a still life, to explore the paints, and see what works best for you. Um, and the entire point of this presentation is just to be patient, take time and see what the paint has to say, see what your application has to say. You know, am I pressing too hard? Am I going too light? Do I need to add more or what? But as you can see, I'm going very light right now because I later on want to add more to it because I'm not exactly sure if this is how I want it to look or not. It has this really nice muted color and I think it just looks pretty like that. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and get that twig. Uh, Meredith, how are we doing on time? Well, uh, if you want to, if you want to keep going, that's fine. Um, we are technically over our allotted time, but um, you know we've got a little little cushion. Um, okay. I did have a question about on your background um, whether or not you had pre wetted the the background area, or if you were just using a very water heavy application of the paint. So uh, with this one that I did, I did pre wet it. Okay, I did pre wet it. And I did do a heavy application because I want to, I want it to look like it's watercolor. So with this 
illustration that I already had done. I had drawn it like step one and step two. Um, and step two also includes applying water. I actually used this filbert brush, I mean this flat brush right here. I just used watercolor, I mean water, just clean water. And then I let it dry. I let it dry and then that's when you saw me pull this out. And I pre-done the background so you can see what it looks like. Um, I hope that answers the question. Does it answer it? I hope so. I think so. And uh, we also had a question on the brand of the watercolors that you're using. Uh huh. Um, and, yes. Uh, is that listed in your references? Because if so, I can just share that directly. Um, it is not. It's called Superior okay. Watercolor. Um, it's actually Chinese, I think. Um, I will get back to you on that, and so that way I can send a link. But it was $30, and, but here's the thing though. The pans are actually very thin, so there isn't a lot of paint in there, but the vibrancy is really strong. Now, you don't see it look strong right there right now, but that's because I'm very, going very, very, very light on my application. But there is a lot of pigments here that I like. And little tray. This is really great for those who um, do watercolor on the go. Like if you're just, you know, hey, I want to go to the park today. Um, I'm just going to bring my watercolors. This is great just to put it in your purse or in your backpack or your fanny pack. I am the least person to judge. I think fanny packs are great. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really cool one. Um, I actually got it a few months ago. And so I really, really like it. Um, I actually don't have a preference on a brand. Um, I, I'm very familiar with the Koi watercolors and I use the, they were, they are tubes. Um, I think they come in, in, in pans as well, but um, I'm used to the tube one. So when I bought this one, I was like, you know what, I really like the vibrancy that you get from this, this set. So um, would it be okay if I send you the link after the presentation? So that way, uh, you know, people can go ahead and reference it. That'd be yeah, okay. we, can, we can include that in the follow-up. Oh, awesome, awesome, great, that's awesome. Is there any other questions as well? So far, no, I think we're good. Okay, great. Um, my question for you is, um, are any of you uh, watercolorists or any of you beginners? Um, does anyone have any, is there a reason behind participating in this program? Um, any how, about we have a, how about we have a raise your hand if you are uh, first time? Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Is there anyone? I, I yeah. cannot see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going up. We've got 14 hands raised so far. Oh, awesome. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping that you guys get a chance to see that, you know, watercolor can be used by anyone. Um, and you do not need to be professional to get the best materials or things like that. My best recommendation is just to get yourself, a, I know that uh, Michaels has that brand Artist Loft. I actually really like their synthetic brushes and um, actually this is that brand Artist Loft. They have a lot of really good stuff. So if you wanna go ahead and get those, I, I, I recommend them. The, pe the pigments are pretty good too, definitely for those who want to kind of get their feet wet, haha, on a lot of Sorry, I, I just had to put a pun in there. I just had to. <laughs> Cannot be a step-by-step uh, -step tutorial if there is no pun. Um, let's see, I'm gonna get some of that brown. Let me see, because I can see a little bit on the pigment. But you let me know when we're done. I mean, I can still keep on going. Um, Let's aim to wrap up at no later than 2.30. How does that sound? That gives you 20 more minutes. Yeah, that uh, sounds great. If, does anybody have technique specific questions that she could demonstrate for you? Oh, that's a good question.
So I mentioned again, um, wet on wet, dry on dry, and wet on dry. And what I mean by that is the, um, the first word is the brush, the second word is the paper. Um, so wet on wet is wet brush on wet paper. Dry on dry is a dry brush on dry paper. And what I mean by dry is, okay, okay, the, here's your brush. Here's your brush. I'm going to dry it, right? It's completely dry. Maybe just a teeny tad to the water because you need water to do watercolor. <laughs> just a little bit, but let's just say this paper is completely dry. Because it is, it's completely dry. And I want to get into some details. So I'm going to get this pigment right here and then like get some of that black, maybe a little bit of that brown. And I'm using this round right here. Okay, let's just pretend I am completely done. I'm getting those details. And then uh, Pam also wanted to know, how do you get the darker outline on the pink flowers versus the lighter? Um, oh, yes, yes. And so how did you get the white space? So there are different ways. You can already have this done and use like a dry brush and dry it out and draw it. You can do this where I'm going to do some detailing. I can do this and maybe go back with some water and then just use that and kind of spread it. You can do this way. And just kind of rub the pencil, the, the brush sorry, over that. You can do it that way. But what you're looking at here is I used a filbert. No, I think I know I didn't use a filbert brush. I used there it is. I used this round, which is a is a bit on the larger end. It's a size two. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and clean this brush first of all. And um, one little note before I kind of demonstrate that is um, when you're cleaning your brushes. My recommendation to clean brushes is to use standard um, either dishwashing soap or hand soap and water and just rub them like this, rub it with your hand until that pigment is gone. And then use your fingers and slightly shape them. The shaping is so important whenever you wanna preserve your brushes because if you don't shape it, it's gonna try like this. So this was around at one point, and if you don't dry it and shape it, it's gonna kind of come a little bit, well, not as when you bought it. Let's just put it that way. Okay, so my brush is ready. Um, I'm gonna begin with this idea again. So what I did is that I, with this nice round brush, it has a lot of uh, room to absorb water, so I'm just gonna get my water again. Um, if, your, if your cup is full of paint, my recommendation for you is to clean it out. The best way is that you can't really see through your cup. <laughs> if it's too dark, you might want to change your water. Um, I am nowhere near a sink at this point, so I don't have the chance to clean my, my glass. But um, if you're near a sink or if you're at home, nearby the kitchen, you know, a quick two minute water, uh, change it, it should be fine. Um, to go back to that uh, idea again, I'm gonna go ahead and use the same idea as on this side. So I'm using this color here that I have, getting some water, and then I'm gonna go ahead and absorb that a little bit. So I have water first, then I got some of the paint. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and apply it like so. And do you see why when I press, how it has that, there's not as much here as there is here, is because I dipped it with water first, and then I added a little bit of paint, and then I press down like that. And I can go back with my brush, clean it slightly so, add more water, 
and just use water. Now I can do that again, going back with the brush, getting, making sure that this brush is filled with water. And then I get some stronger pigments on the tips, right, right here. It's pretty strong actually, but I'm just using this as a demo. And then And do you see why I, meant, I mentioned to draw really lightly? Because if you use a, like a B pencil or anything like really thick on the graphite, that graphite is gonna spread onto the water. It's gonna make your drawing a little bit, you know, grayish tone for the most part. Um, I'm applying some more water onto my brush again, just kind of. Yeah. Um, now, if the pencil gets go oh, go ahead. I was going to say, sure. could you do a quick demonstration of how to uh, remove a accidental color drop? Like, say you accidentally dripped a color and you didn't want it to be on there. Yes. So I'm going to do that. Um, so. One thing before I go further is that um, watercolor is not forgivable. Um, if, let's just say I have some red that, you know, dropped here. Okay, you can do two things. You can either use it, because there is actually some flowers inside my glass. I could use it as pomegranate. I guess I could just use this as a reference where there's some flowers here. I can use that. I can add more water. Um, or you can use your, your um, paper towel and then just lightly dab it. Like so. So it's no longer, I mean, it's still there. I mean, once it's there, it's there. But there are ways on how to to you know hide it i guess is my best word does that help a little bit at all yes i think so that yes the, yeah okay okay um okay so that is something that what's that i'm gonna go back with my smaller detail and um work on some of those flowers that i was uh wanting to kind of complete here so One thing about uh, um, painting flowers is that you want to allow, you, you cannot draw every crevice, right? That's what makes the flowers um, such a really nice topic to paint is the fact that there is a lot of fluidity. There is a lot of organic um, shapes. Um, and that's what makes it really, you know, um, I guess makes it more relatable for, for people who are beginning to paint. Um, you can also use these techniques to help create motifs. If you are, if you like to make cards for friends, you can use this as a way to, to, to do that for a card. Or if you're doing um, invitations or things like that, you can use these techniques of drawing flowers to help you do those little motifs at the end of of names, um, it's really up to you. A lot of these little techniques and things that you're seeing here, um, you can utilize in your own way. And I think, I think that's really beautiful about it. So I'm gonna work on some smaller leaves here that I'm gonna use around. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, as you saw some water, I got some of this green here. I used a little bit here and um, Got this here. I got some some red. Why not add a little bit of red? And it has this really pretty muted green. And I'm just gonna. It's as you can see, this brush has lots of water in it. There's still some water in there, so 
that is a good thing. I'm gonna go from the tip of the brush and then press down. Tip of the brush and then press down. Tip of the brush and press down. And it makes a really nice teardrop shape. Well, I really hope that you guys, um, uh, you know, enjoyed this program. It was a lot of fun showing you about watercolors. It's a really neat pro uh, program to me just because, um, you know, I really connect with watercolors. I find it very calming, and I hope you all uh, find that too. Um, there's so many things that we can learn from watercolors. Um, yeah, I think it's just a great medium to do. And it's also really good for gifts. If you feel like you like, you know, like to give people things, and you have the time to do so. The idea of just making something for a friend or a loved one, I think that's a really, really nice thing to do. And if you have time to do that, um, you can go ahead and use this idea, this program as a way to inspire you to give to others and to, you know, it's just a really nice medium over and all. I really enjoy it. So I have these really pretty white and like lavender flowers here. Let me go ahead and show you what I'm, what I'm looking. Can you guys see the details? Yeah. That's really pretty, this, this little like brown here. Um, I'm gonna go and show you a little bit where I'm working on. So there's these really pretty light flowers that I'm gonna paint. Or attempt to. Okay. Would you guys like to see me zoom in or do you guys want to see me actually mix the paint like that? Okay, so we'll just leave it like that. I really am happy that you all are here today and um, you know spending your afternoon with, with us, um, having us show you how to do this. We um, are very excited about doing all these virtual programs. It's really exciting that, you know, we're, we're sharing all of our love for all things programming and doing things virtually, and being able to connect with you all in different ways. So I'm really excited about that. I think it's a really great thing that the city has to offer. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really nice to have you all here today. And I'm very grateful that you all are here. Thank you all so much for spending your time here. I, I hope that this inspires you um, to, you know, wake up in the morning on a Saturday, make some coffee and just have your little setup and just play some music and just, you know, enjoy yourself. Right now I'm doing a bit of, I already had painted white, but it looks a little green because I didn't clean my brush real too much. So I'm keeping that green, uh, white color here. I'm doing a dry on wet. So this is wet, my brush is dry. And so right now, uh, you're kind of looking at that technique demonstrated here. And I'm going really light. And I'm gonna add a little bit of watercolor, I mean water, just to spread that paint. Now, is, there, is, this, is this the correct way to do it? No. It is because that's how I see, like, how I want to do it. Um, another great thing about watercolors, there's no right or wrong. It's really what works best for you. Do you feel like this is the great way, uh, a good way on how to paint this flower or this leaf or this shrub or this, you know, vine? Then that's how it works. And if it doesn't work the way you want to, that's totally fine. Uh, another idea would be to have a sheet of paper and just paint flowers and see which technique works best for you. Hey, Jackie, right now, we have a question on how you sign your work. Do you do it with pencil or uh, other another medium? Um, so what I like to do is I like to um, pencil. So I uh, had taken a class on um, 
printmaking. And I know for sure printmaking, many people tend to use pencil as a way to number their prints, right? And their signatures. Uh, for my signature, I would like to go ahead and um, wait, obviously, for the painting to be dry completely. Um, I would then want to remove the tape patiently. And um, you can sign your name on this white part right here. Um, my signature is a basic initials, but I keep my, my name and my maiden name. Sorry, Ricky. Um, <laughs> it's this way. So that's my signature. So I'll, I, would, I would probably put like a little signature right here um, with a pen. Um, or um, you can use a dry brush if you want. If you feel comfortable signing your name with the brush, you can too. Uh, but you have to, you know, uh, be very careful with your application. I would just go very light like this, hold the, pen, the brush like this, get your paint, um, and then just with very little water, grab it and then do it like that. You can do that too, or you can sign in the back of the paper. Um, but if I were to do it, um, I would normally just put my name, right, my initials right here, and then I would put the date of when I painted it. Um, but that's just a preference. Again, a, 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 with, with watercolor, it's really up to you. Um, if you feel like you want to just not put a name at all and you want to send this as a card, you know, by all means do that. Um, whatever I'm saying is completely prefer preferable on whatever you find that you want to do. Um, but for me, um, I would wait until I'm done with step five. <clears throat> Make sure it's dry and remove it and everything else. Yes, what's up? We have one last question I think we can fit in here is, um, can we paint on canvas with watercolor? Um, they said they've seen some paintings in art shows and uh, how do they do that? Um, so there are some canvas materials that can be able to do watercolor. Um, what I'm familiar with is just watercolor paper. And um, the way they do that is that, you know, they uh, have like a, a really nice frame that they have it set up. So it looks a bit more three three-dimensional as opposed to what you see here as a paper or a sheet. Um, I would actually look into that. I do not recommend buying like, you know, a set of, of um, right now, at least since um, the majority of you in my assumption are beginners, um, to not go to Michael's and get a set of watercolor, of, of, not watercolors, um, canvas and use watercolors on the canvas. Um, just because canvas is specifically held, generally, uh, canvas that you purchase is generally held for like acrylics or um, oils um, because it, that texture is meant for that. And the surface has that, that surface has that, uh, the application, that it's, it's for that application. Um, I, I really recommend getting watercolor paper. Um, Artis is also a really good brand. Um, play around with the weights of the paper. Um, so I feel that I think it really depends on t up to you. If you if you find that there is a canvas um, that watercolor can be applied, you know, try it out. Um, I have not personally tried it out, but if um, you want to, by all means. But for the general consensus. Uh, buying just standard, you know, sets or like a single canvas and then getting watercolors, you're going to find it's going to be kind of hard to apply it and you might have to apply a bit more than normal and I cannot guarantee you if that application is even going to stay on the surface. Yeah, if, if you do decide you want to go the canvas route, um, anything that is watercolor specific will have it noted mm -hmm. on the label. Um, other canvases, they just don't have the uh, absorption necessary to really work with watercolor. So that's just something to keep in mind. Yes, definitely. Whenever you're purchasing materials, 
please pay attention to what is specified for. Because if you go to um, any art store um, or even online, um, you're going to see that there are materials and tools designed for specific purposes. So if you go to Michael's and you buy yourself a, a set of brushes and it says it's for oil and you see the texture, it's really, really thick and like uh, meant for what oils, it's because it's meant for oils, you know? Um, again, thank you, Meredith. Yeah, definitely a really good point. Please pay attention to what the materials say before purchasing um, that. Is there any other questions so far? Um, no, I think we are at the 2.30 mark, so we've got to wrap it up. Um, we have had some requests to see the final painting, so if you uh, want to finish that up for them, we can share it later. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to having this finished. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much it for me. Um, again, thank you all for part of coming in and joining. Um, the flowers that I got, I got this morning. Um, you can also use, uh, you know, um, uh, false flowers like at Michael's or like at a Dollar General. Um, you can get those too. The part of flowers is that it's a really great way to look at it just because it's, it's just so organic and water is also very organic. So two organic things together makes it a really joyous and calming and wonderful experience to experiment with. Again, I'm very, I'm very happy that you all are here today. It was a joy showing you how to do watercolors. Um, I think that's it for me.